Can the Missouri governor hang on? The Kansas school stalemate ends, or has it? Shutting down the American Jazz Museum? And it's getting contentious. Now the mayor launching a panel to decide how to honor Dr. King. Week in Review is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, Smithfield Foods, Haas and Wilkerson Insurance, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Nick Haynes. Those stories and more straight ahead in a week that has witnessed one eye-popping news revelation after another. Here to make sense of it all, Mr. Up to Date on KCUR FM, Steve Kraske, getting up earlier in the morning than anyone should have to to deliver you the news from the Fox 4 morning news team, Mark Alford, from the pages of the Kansas City Call newspaper, Eric Wesson, and Kansas City Star columnist and editorial writer, Dave Helling. He blindfolded and bound a woman to exercise equipment, spanked her, spat water in her mouth, and coerced her into oral sex. And the women's story apparently is credible, at least according to the findings of a month-long investigation by a bipartisan grouping of Missouri lawmakers probing allegations against Governor Eric Greitens. It's a story making national news this week. Latest on that scandal facing the governor of Missouri. Well, a former GOP rising star faces new calls to resign. A Missouri legislative panel finally releases its report this week and graphically describes the first alleged encounter between the governor and his former hairstylist in the then Republican candidate's basement while his wife was away from home. Missouri Attorney General Josh Hawley says the grounds now exist to impeach Greitens and he's urging his fellow Republican to step down. The governor remains defiant. Let's call this what it is, a political witch hunt now based on the testimony of someone who said under oath that they may be remembering this through a dream. Now, given the governor's words, I'm assuming he doesn't intend to listen to the state ad attorney general and step aside, Steve. No indications of that whatsoever, Nick. He's going to stick around, despite the fact this report that you've referred to really changed the math in Jefferson City this week. We began uh, the week by thinking about this whole uh, escapade as a, a photo that was taken, blackmail. Now we're talking about uh, assault, battery, and uh, we have Republicans coming out of the woodwork now in Jeff City turning against the governor and asking him to resign. In a previous show, it was said, well, it won't make much of a difference until some of his own donors start backing away from him. And this week, one of the governor's top donors, giving more than $2 million to his campaign in 2016, is saying he should resign too. And that's David Humphreys, the Joplin right. businessman. Right. And uh, it's another sign that uh, Eric Greitens is in deep trouble, not with Democrats, but with Republicans. Two things we learned this week, Nick. Uh, Eric Greitens has few friends even with his, in his own party, obviously, not just David Humphreys and Josh Hawley, but Mike Keogh, the majority leader of the Senate, uh, said he should uh, step aside. Other Republicans joining that course. The second thing is there's no political penalty to pay if you're a Republican criticizing the governor. They all came out and said it, and that's so critical in the environment that exists. I know we'll talk a little bit about impeachment here coming up, but the reality is everyone in Jefferson City, with one or two exceptions, hopes the governor resigns because it would spare the state this uh, difficulty uh, and, and get this behind them. And uh, that's really what a lot of folks are talking about. In a lot of these details, though, were out starting in January. Right. What was new? What was what were the new revelations that make this different this week? I think the new parts that made it really different were that it confirmed through the deposition that it was non-consensual. There was some intimation up to this point that it was a consensual sexual affair before he even started running for governor. That's what Governor Greitens had said. There was no real dispute from the woman's standpoint and it came out this, this, uh, uh, this account of hers uh, that it was not all consensual. But the report also finds she did have consensual sex with the governor after that first encounter and that there is actually no physical evidence contained in that report. Uh, does that make it much harder to prove criminally that there was um, acts taking place when that scheduled trial takes place next month, Eric? Yeah, I believe it is without the picture. But I think the damaging part is will he be able to get 
anything passed or will the legislature even focus on anything or they will they be dealing with this for the rest of his term in office but no I don't think they they claim they don't have the picture they claim it's his word against hers but I think it's more damaging that testimony really 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 hurt him. Dave. Uh, a couple of things first of all the trial in May will not involve these more salacious accusations about assault and battery that's not part of the charge the charge is simply taking the picture invasion of privacy uh, and it remains curious to me why the grand jury in St. Louis did not bring charges on these other allegations from the woman. Mm -hmm. Presumably she told the grand jury the same thing she told the special committee. We'll have to sort of get a better understanding of that going forward. If Second, she... just quickly, it's a seven-member House committee, five Republicans, two Democrats, all signed the report, all said they found her testimony credible. And when it comes down to a testimony from a victim against someone else, credibility is what it's all about, and that's what, why that's important. But also reasonable doubt when it comes to the criminal charge of invasion of privacy. If she says in this deposition that she thinks she may have dreamed part of this, I, I can imagine a first-year law student uh, getting the governor acquitted in that trial for that purpose. You know, but she also said that she had the blindfold on and she saw flashes of light. So because she didn't actually see a phone or a camera, that might be a ground. Lots kind of, of words being brought up this week, mm -hmm. the I word, the impeachment word, but that's not an easy process, is it? No, it's not an easy process, and it shouldn't be, Nick, uh, but uh, you hear lots of lawmakers talking about it. You need to get 50% uh, plus one of members of the House to launch the process. It then goes over to the state Senate, who appoints seven distinguished jurists, judges, if you will, to review the case, uh, review evidence. Presumably, they would call uh, witnesses and seek information, too. If five of those seven judges call for impeachment, the governor's out. Now. None of that happens quickly. No, one would assume not. Plus, let's keep in mind the House committee is still at work taking a look at other allegations involving the governor's charity uh, before he became governor and fundraising lists, that type of thing. That work won't be done for some time. And we do expect the committee to make a recommendation as well. Now, we don't know the timetable for that either, but even if the House passed an impeachment resolution today, it would still presumably take some time before the seven jurists in the Senate could hear the case, probably extending beyond the end of the uh, session in mid-May, and that's why there's a lot of yak about a special session. Let's remind forward. ourselves of who actually would become governor if Eric Reitens decided to step aside or there were to be an impeachment. Remember this man? I'm Mike Parson. My Missouri values run deep and are rooted in agriculture. I'm a third-generation farmer, veteran, and former sheriff who believes government is best when it does the least. It's why All righty, Mike Parson then, the lieutenant governor, would take that seat, but we don't know a huge amount about him. We don't, uh, but we do know that he's a former House member. He's a former member of the state Senate, Nick. Highly regarded. Members of both parties seem to have some faith and trust in him he's, as a fair player, a conservative guy but uh, someone I think that the legislature, broadly speaking, uh, could embrace if he became governor. I was just wondering, does he have any allies at all in the legislature? Are you talking about Eric Greitens? Yes, Greitens, because when he starts picking these panels of these judges that uh, Steve was talking about, does he have any allies that would be, well, maybe this is another way to look at it? I don't think it. he'll be picking those judges. That's a task the state Senate would be, be involved with, not mm -hmm. the governor himself. But in the meantime, you have the governor perhaps having authority over bills getting passed by the legislature and this incredibly scary dynamic where the, uh, the governor might say, I'll sign this bill if you can guarantee me support for keeping me in office, that's a dynamic that all Missourians should be aware of and keep watch on going forward. It's worth repeating that criminal charges are accusations, not evidence of a crime, and that defendants are innocent until proven guilty. We discussed it last week. Now is it finally over? I'm talking about the stalemate over Kansas schools. They may not be attracting the lurid and salacious headlines coming out of the Missouri Capitol, but Kansas lawmakers dealing with their own crisis. But is it now solved? Everybody declared passed. The new K-12 through funding bill adds $534 million to Kansas schools over the next five years. Governor Jeff Collier says he intends to approve it. I expect that we'll be signing this. We've been supportive of this. This is a good compromise. This sucks us dry on all the other budget needs. 
Two different views on the actions of Kansas lawmakers before they headed out of town, ending the regular session of the legislature. Perhaps the bigger question, are there actions enough now to stop the Kansas Supreme Court from shutting down schools, Dave Helling? Uh, the general consensus is probably not, or at least there's a fear, a real fear, that 534 million, whatever it turns out to be, there's an error they've got to fix, some other things, but whatever that number turns out to be, roughly a hundred million dollars a year just won't be enough to satisfy the court. It does not appear to be enough to satisfy the plaintiffs in the case who have in essence said no, 600 million in one year. So uh, my guess is there will continue to be arguments in the courts and this isn't over yet. One in two dollars in Kansas that is in the general fund budget goes already right. for K through 12 education. What does this do then for all of the other services in government from prisons to mental health services to highways? if so much of the money will be going towards schools at this point? Well, in the short term, Nick, it does nothing because lawmakers are confident that there's an increase, enough of an increase in revenue this year to come up with the money they need for the first year's down payment on this five-year plan going forward. So no impact in the short term, arguably more of an impact in years two, three, and four going forward. Last week, we reported on a new petition drive to rename Paseo Boulevard after Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. But is that the best way of honoring the slain civil rights leader? This week, the mayor announcing a new panel to study that and to make a recommendation within 45 days. I talked about the fact that we were going to have conversations about race, equity, and inclusion. This is a prime opportunity to start that conversation. The mayor says his new 11-member panel represents some of the finest this community has to <laughs> offer, and among them is Eric Wesson of the Cole newspaper. Eric, I'm assuming the mayor, Sly James, <laughs> can't be that happy with the idea of renaming the Paseo after Dr. King. Otherwise, why would he bother going through this process? To get community feedback, to see what the community thinks about just one option. Maybe there's some other options people have. I've gotten quite a few phone calls and other members of of the committee that I've spoken with, and there's other options that people would be more inclined to go along with than Paseo, an east-west street. The new airport has come up in several conversations as well. But, you know, Paseo or nothing, I think uh, the community wants to say something about Now, if that. there was a topic we've received more questions and comments about than any other this year, it is this one. Let's address some of them. Amanda writes, wouldn't it be better to honor Dr. King by reclaiming the area burned and abandoned in the riots 50 years ago? Let it be the Martin Luther King District, erect a monument to the riot and those who died, set up a center for vocational retraining, tutoring, language training, and union apprenticeships, IT certification programs. Would that be a more meaningful designation for Dr. King than just renaming a street, Steve Kresge? Well, I think this is all in the eye of the beholder, Nick. Uh, you can imagine this is going to be a robust conversation going forward because there is no one right answer here, you've got a tough challenge on your plate because there will be as many different opinions here as there are Kansas Cityans in a sense. <laughs> uh, the ministers are a fairly potent political force in this community. They are 100% behind this idea of renaming the Paseo. I wouldn't want to get in their way, but maybe other ideas will prevail. Phil writes, Kansas City is most proud of its new and expanding streetcar. What better idea is there than to name that after Martin Luther King Jr., Mark? And I'm wondering, Eric, why, why does it have to be a historically African-American part of town or section or neighborhood that we have an MLK Boulevard? I went to the University of Texas at Austin. The 40-acre campus is bordered to the south by MLK Boulevard. It's a thriving area, lots of bustling business. Why not? Name something as prestigious as Ward Parkway. I mean, MLK was a hero for everyone. Why not honor him in the best way possible by renaming one of the finest streets? As a panel member, Eric is taking your comments <laughs> right. under advice. Is that right, that Eric? Down. Dave. Right, that down. Just to add quickly that the ministers who are behind this effort came to the editorial board before it was formally announced. And I can tell you that we asked them all these exact questions. Why not East-West? Why not Prospect? Why not Troost? Why not something nearer to the plaza, the Volcker Boulevard, right. some other? And they were adamant that they wanted to do the Paseo. And they were adamant that they can collect enough signatures to put it on the ballot. If that's the case, with all due respect to my friend Eric Wesson, whatever the commission comes up with will be 
opposite to whatever the ministers have said they want to do, and there's a collision there that's almost inevitable. You may disagree with that, but they don't seem like they're willing to compromise right. on anything, and so I think we've got a, a real a budding Is there an opportunity, though, for compromise? Surely, writes, there's an easy way to resolve the conflict over whether to rename the Paseo, starting with the fact that the term Paseo Boulevard is redundant in the first place. Paseo means street or byway in Spanish, so let's correct everything and <laughs> name it the Paseo Martin Luther King Jr. Is that the way to solve it, Eric? Uh, I don't know. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if there's a right or wrong way to do it. But this is what, and like Dave said, the, the ministers are adamant about this. They sent out an email yesterday. It's, the email started out, no Paseo, no truce, no this, no other options that people have had. But with the East-West thing, some of the people are like, there's never been a black business on Main Street. A black name has never gone across it. So this would be an opportunity to do that. And, and, and one more thing, legally, would the Parks Board, even if the people vote on it, because Remember, several years ago, citizens voted for a streetcar. The council came back and overturned that. So it they, they could, voted for Clay Chastain's light rail proposal right, and, and overturned it. And the city council came back and overturned it. So if people vote for Paseo to be that name, is it a possibility that it could, it could be overturned? You know, with controversy comes opportunity. And certainly in this case, Nick, Kansas City remains perhaps the largest city in the country without any street named after Martin Luther King. It appears that if nothing else happens here, that's going to change, yeah. and that's a good thing. Is it time to shut down the American Jazz Museum at 18th and Vine? A scathing report commissioned by the city recommends closing the attraction for up to a year to allow for a complete rebirth of the 21-year-old institution. The report also called for a shakeup in the museum's leadership and its board. The attraction lost a million dollars last year, and it had to be bailed out by the city. What's the museum's response to this unflattering review, Eric? They had a response. They said that they agreed with some of the things that were in the report. But uh, as far as Chepto being replaced, she's there for the long haul. Uh, you think some so? Some of the other things, some of the good things that weren't mentioned in the report, like teenage kids are coming in from schools and they're seeing that part of history, that part of the museum. So their work, First Friday has been somewhat successful. So they're banking on the things that are there positive. But on the financial aspect, the leadership, you got a 23-member board. What do you need that many people on a board for not raising money? Because if they were doing what boards are supposed to do and raise money, they wouldn't have to keep begging The Star Editorial the Board says that the museum has acquired more than $80 million in city subsidies since it opened. But if there were to be a complete rebirth of this institution, isn't it going to mean a lot more tax money being poured into well, it? Or, on or top of that? donations or something. I mean, you can't do this for free if indeed you want to redo the museum. And I think that's a critical part of this uh, study, Nick. Uh, the exhibits at the museum haven't changed in 20 years. It's the same thing it was the day they cut the ribbon. That means nobody really has a reason to go back. The kids are getting some education, but there's no reason for the general public to see it more than once or twice. So you don't get revenue at the gate. It's harder to raise money. And I think the impetus behind the study was close the doors, figure that out, get yourself a budget, a curator who knows what he or she is doing about gathering artifacts, and, and, and go forward on that basis. Until that happens, you get the sense that it's just going to be leaping from every six-month crisis. You to know, six months. all that is good, but what the report doesn't talk about in any great depth is the need for money and a lot of money to, to buy new exhibits, expand the museum, uh, you know, go out and get artifacts that are valuable that people would want to see. That's what's needed, and you can close the museum for five years and still have that issue hanging out there. But we talk about ourselves as a jazz town, but are we willing to support jazz? We saw that the Corporate Woods Jazz Festival after decades is going to be no more. They couldn't get enough advertising support to continue to make that happen. When we run jazz programs on KCPT, national jazz programs, we're not one of the top markets in the country for that program. Well, I hope it's not the case like we've had with the American Royal, where the city basically ran the American Royal organization over in DeWyandot County. This is part of our heritage. We need to protect it. We need to support it. The question is, how much money do you continue uh, the taxpayers' dollars to pump into an area where people, obviously, for whatever reason, are not coming down? We need to spend the money in to get people excited to come down to the area. 
How much did they pay the consultants to go in and do that? <laughs> I think that it was, was six probably, figures. Yeah, that was probably pretty expensive too. So maybe some of that money could have went into. But but let's but, but let's be clear. The the the, the, the reason this study was uh, ordered was because of the million dollar shortfall that was left over after a failed jazz concert, and a, 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 an exhaustion on the part of City Hall to continue to throw money at the jazz museum. And look at the contrast, if you will, with the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, which mm -hmm. is just across the hallway. It's Bob Kendrick. And uh, they have done a reasonable good job of raising money, finding artifacts, and continuing to raise the interest of the public in what happens down there. Uh, the Jazz Museum can look at that, I think, as a model, and that's kind of what this report was trying to tell. But the Negro Leagues Baseball, Bob does a phenomenal job, but they've got Buck. And everything that they well, do, they haven't had Buck for some time. But they know. got Buck's name, yeah, yeah. and people still love Buck. Yeah, yeah. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg took a grilling on Capitol Hill this week over the company's failure to protect the private data of tens of millions of its users. Meanwhile, the Missouri Attorney General announces his own investigation into Facebook and is demanding that the social media company disclose each time it shared users' personal data with a political group. Facebook is based in Menlo Park, California, nearly 2,000 miles away from Josh Hawley's office in Jefferson City. Is there a specific concern with Facebook that uniquely impacts Missouri citizens, Steve? Well, I'm not sure there's a, a specific uh, situation here. Uh, Josh Hawley is running for the U.S. Senate this year against Claire McCaskill. Uh, he'll be on the ballot in November. Uh, most likely, and this is the kind of issue that helps a candidate like that you know, garner broad appeal and get his face and name out before the public. So that might be fueling some of this. And, and in fairness to the Attorney General, this is an issue that has been of concern to a lot of people. What, uh, how much information has been disclosed uh, to uh, private vendors? Mark Zuckerberg this week, uh, before the Congress was asked, would he be willing to disclose where he s spent the night, uh, the previous night in a hotel in Washington? And he said no. But that's that's precisely the kind of information that's been released uh, to, by, by uh, as a result of all there this. There was scandal. also news this week that Claire McCaskill, who will be running against, of course, Josh Hawley, as it looks like right now, as the U.S. Senator, the Democrat from Missouri, that she took the second most amount of money of anyone on Capitol Hill from Facebook uh, employees and their political action committees. Right, and so that may be an issue in the election. You know, the bar continues to go up on Josh Hawley or Claire McCaskill when they make announcements or uh, proposals. There's a lot of politics involved in this. You know, Josh Hawley is also involved in pursuing Google, uh, and I think some of that is designed to get his name in the newspaper. You may not check your receipt to always be aware of it, but there are now some places in Kansas City where the sales tax on your restaurant meal or on that shirt you bought at your local favorite retailer now exceeds 12 percent. If that seems excessive, Missouri lawmakers are now trying to put a stop to it, and it's making Kansas City Mayor Sly James angry. There is no reason for the state of Missouri to come in and tell the people of Kansas City, you can't make sure that you have money to provide for basic services and uh, for the people who provide them. Now, the mayor is incensed at a new bill working its way through the Missouri legislature that would block cities from boosting the combined sales tax above 14 percent. What is Mayor James afraid of if this law went into effect, Eric? CID taxes, funding for the police department, <clears throat> funding for the police department, and some of the other things that the earnest tax and those other taxes uh, go into to help fund. And CIDs, when you have those community development things that they have, it pays for security, safety, police, and those sort of things. So he's trying to say, pretty much stay out of our business. Wouldn't most members of the public, though, Mark Alford, feel like 12% was a huge <laughs> amount as it was? I was just looking through the sales tax on Rodeo, Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills, the combined Where rate there. often. Absolutely, yes. is 9.5%. <laughs> yes. On Fifth Avenue in New York, 887 Five percent, and yet even if you had actually clothing under one hundred and ten dollars, there actually is no sales tax in New York City. I don't know if people City. actually look at the receipts. They probably should, just like you should look at your withholding uh, for your paycheck to see what you're actually paying the federal government. But it is clear that uh, taxes are going up. The mayor obviously does not want interference. He's seeing it as a political uh, move. Here's a, a Republican-controlled house uh, in 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 Missouri, Jeff City, that wants to tell a 
a Democrat city what to do, basically. Quickly, I think the mayor does get irritated when the legislature injects itself into what should be local decisions. He's mad, and most Kansas Cityans are mad that they have to vote on the earnings tax every five years. That's another state thing. But Kansas City's local taxes are hugely regressive. I can't say that enough. We have an oversized sales tax, which hurts the poor, little less of an impact in Missouri than in Kansas because the state sales tax exempts food. And second, the earnings tax is regressive. We, have, we overtax locally poorer people. And that's one of the reasons we have problems with housing and crime and development and other things. And the mayor should pay a little bit of attention to that. Too. I'm always fascinated by how Kansas City is viewed around the nation and around the world. This week, the PBS NewsHour spends a full 10 minutes uh -huh. of its broadcast spotlighting Kansas City. What attracted them? Was it the headlines over the governor, school funding in Kansas, the murder charges in the Schlitterbahn water park tragedy? No, the PBS News crew spends days encamped here to tackle our problem with mental illness. Apparently, the PBS NewsHour spent days in Camp Tier saying one in three people in Kansas City going through the court system is mentally ill. They'll, they'll cuss at me in court. They're saying nonsensical things, and their lawyers like going, I don't know what to do here. And that's sort of, sort of uh, symbolic of the entire community. We don't know what to do here. The news hour talks to local judges, rides along with the police visits, Truman Medical Center and a new mental health triage center. The city opened a year and a half ago with the help of local foundations and health care providers. But by the way, you can see that full report on our Week in Review page at kcpt.org. But is there any evidence that we are progressing on this issue, putting more resources we into are, mental illness? We are talking about it more, which is a huge step. Our You Matter campaign at Fox Force, part of that. The police putting more efforts and resources into taking social workers and mental health counselors with them on calls. I've talked to police officers and even the chief. They go out there and they can't make sense of a situation. They're put in an impossible situation a lot of times, dealing with people who don't have the mental capacity to reason. Uh, quickly, how about our state lawmakers? Are they injecting huge amounts of new cash into mental health? No, not yet, but Mark is right. We are seeing a new dawning here, a new sense of awareness of, of how exactly how broad and how deep this issue is, not only in Missouri and Kansas, but across the country. Uh, Senator uh, Roy Blunt talks about this issue with some regularity. That's a step forward, but I'm not sure the public really has quite grasped the, the severity here of this issue uh, going forward. And that is our Week in Review. Our thanks to our news reviewers. I'm Nick Haynes from all of us here at KCPT. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.